Hey all y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carrie. This is where I talk about knitting, my tips, my tricks, my opinions, and my preferences. I will be the first one to say I do not love weaving in ends. That's my favorite part of the knitting process. But it is an essential knitting skill. It is one of those things that differentiates work looking handmade versus homemade. And we want our work to look handmade. Now a while back I did do a video on using duplicate stitch to weave in ends and that is my favorite method but there are other weaving in techniques and there are definitely times to utilize them. So today we're gonna look at weaving in ends for garter stitch so hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give my video a thumbs up and let's weave in some ends. In the description, I provide links to materials used in this video. To help support my channel, I do utilize affiliate links. All affiliate links are clearly indicated. For more information on affiliate links, please visit my FAQ at knitswhereitsat.com. Why do I find weaving in ends to be one of my least favorite knitting activities? I honestly am not sure. I think I just find it a little bit of a tedious process. And it is probably at a point in the work where I feel like, Ooh, I just want to rush to the end, and this is the thing that's in my way. The weaving at the end is in my way to having a finished product. Yeah, I, weaving at ends is not one of my favorite things to do. It's not, it never will be. It's okay. But I do it. Eventually. <laughs> there is a time and a place for various types of weaving in techniques. My favorite is duplicate stitch. It is the one, it is my go-to. But there are other techniques. There is a horizontal weave-in, there is vertical weave-in, there is weaving in your tails diagonally, and all of these ways of weaving in and have their place in your toolbox. So let's dive into this. First, we're going to take a look at garter stitch, and we'll look at it actually in terms of utilizing duplicate stitch, utilizing a modified duplicate stitch, and then looking at utilizing a horizontal weave. On garter stitch. I always encourage you to watch the whole video at least once, but life is happening. Timestamps are in the description box if you would like to jump around. It can be a little bit tricky with duplicate stitch and garter stitch. On this swatch, I did this one row here in a contrasting color so you could clearly see the yarn path. Right here is the purl bump, right? But you don't see the running threads. The running threads are on the opposite side, right here. So these are the running threads. So when you do duplicate stitch, true duplicate stitch with garter, you need to weave that tail so that it's moving back and forth between the front of the fabric and the back of the fabric. Okay, so here I am, and I'm going to follow the blue path, and it's always a little harder to see this on the very edge, but I'm going to pull this apart, and right here, here's that blue thread, and it's coming out of this stitch right here. This is the stitch it's coming out of, right? So I'm going to take my needle, and I'm going to bring it up into that stitch to follow that, okay? now. That leg then comes up under this running thread right here. So here's that purl bump. I'm going to bring my stitch up into this running thread on this row above. Follow the purl bump down into the running stitch of the row above, the left running stitch of the row above. And then follow the leg back down into the stitch I first came into right here. And here's the thing though. We'll follow this into here. The running thread, I can't see it. It's behind the work, but it's coming into this next stitch. So I can bring my needle right into this stitch here next to it. All right. And now I have duplicated that stitch. I'll do it again on this stitch next to it. So here's my leg that I'm following. I come up to the right running thread of the row above. Follow the purl bump down into the left 
running thread of the row above. And then I can follow that leg down. Oops, move that. Follow this leg down into the stitch here. And I'm gonna freeze this here because I want to point something out. Uh, right now the needle is behind two legs of different stitches. A running thread always connects two different stitches. So right now that needle is behind the left leg of one stitch and behind the right leg of the stitch next to it. And that is how you can do a true duplicate stitch in garter. And you can see, oh look, <laughs> those two blue stitches just disappeared. And if you look on this side, where I'm doing the duplicate stitch, you can still see these running legs underneath because I haven't, I haven't woven over those. There it is. That's the right here. This is the tail that I just wove in, and it's just underneath these two blue running threads. There are times being comfortable with this technique are really useful in garter. Let's say you're going to do a work that's truly reversible that you may want to do a true duplicate stitch with garter. Maybe you're wanting to uh, correct a mistake in color work. If you're wanting to really train your eye on how to do this, making a practice swatch like this where you use a contrasting thread for just one row can really kind of help your eye see what is going on. So there you go. And the nice thing about using duplicate stitch always when weaving in your tails is then when you go to stretch and move the work, the tail just moves with the fabric because you've recreated that same undulation of yarn. And if you match your tension well, the weave is just very discreet. And it's also very secure because when you stretch and pull the fabric, your tail is just moving with the fabric as though it were knitted in. But using duplicate stitch to weave in your ends with garter stitch, it, it can be tricky because you are having to. Follow that path so that it goes behind two legs of the stitch and you don't really see the running thread. And the other thing is on the other side, right here where the running thread is, you can see both threads. Where the yarn came underneath, the running threads can be a little bit thicker, it can be a little bit more obvious. This is a minor detail, but there it is. But there's something even easier that you can do when weaving in your ends for garter stitch. And that is to do sort of a modified, what I think of as a modified duplicate stitch. Um, later on in the swatch, I did two rows in the contrasting color. And the reason I did this is I wanted you to see that in garter stitch, almost the illusion of a knit stitch is created. And let me explain what I mean. So if you look closely, here's my blue pearl bump, right? Now this is one row. Of blue. Down here is a right running thread and a left running thread, and this is a second row of blue stitches. However, I can follow this right running leg up into this pearl bump, come up here, follow this pearl bump down, and right here it almost looks like a stitch. It's not one stitch. This is two rows of knitting, but it creates the illusion of a knit stitch. And I can actually follow this to create a mock duplicate stitch. I'm going to do this because all my tails are on this side. I'm going to do this from left to right instead of right to left, but it's fine. It's, it's the same process. So I'm going to follow this blue running leg and it's going to come up into a pearl bump, this pearl bump. And then I'm going to come up into this running leg where the, this pearl bump is coming out of. Follow this running leg down into here. And then this leg, this running thread is coming out of this pearl bump. So I'm gonna just come back into that same pearl bump. And this is just a much easier path to follow because everything is staying on this. The tail is moving into and out of stitch spaces that are all on the same side of the fabric. Oops, got a little caught up there. There we go. And the tail is being secured on just one side of the fabric. Unlike doing a duplicate stitch in garter where the tail is moving between the front and the back of the work, here the tail is staying all on one side of the work. 
But what's interesting about this is this looks now like an elongated knit stitch. So your tail is still creating that same shape, that same knit stitch shape as your stitches. It's just doing it over two rows instead of one. The advantage of that is when I stretch and move the work, the tail will stretch and move along with the knitting as well. And that's because the tail is making that same shape as a knit stitch. So again, this is a very secure, very discreet weave. And what's nice is the tail is all on one side. So if this is the wrong side of my fabric and this is the right side, you don't even see the weave on the right side of the fabric because the tail is kept to the back of the work. So this is a very nice, easy, elegant way of weaving in your tails for garter stitch, and I love it. I love it. But there is another way that you can weave in your tails with garter stitch that works very well that we'll take a look at next. With this weave, you're actually going to pierce the fibers of your yarn. So it's actually easier to do this if you have a sharper tapestry needle than this big eyed blunt tip tapestry needle. Right here is the legs. So here's my pearl bump. Right down here is the legs of that stitch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my tapestry needle and I'm going to just pierce the thread so that the tapestry needle is just catching underneath the first one or maybe two plies of the yarn. This is the other thing with this technique. It really works best for yarns that are plied. Single plied yarns are a little iffy. And I'm gonna just pull that through. Something that's important is I don't wanna pull this too tight. Now I'm gonna do the same thing into the next stitch. And I'm just going to, again, very carefully just pierce the legs of the stitches that I'm weaving into. And you don't need a ton of fiber. You want to have this stay towards the back. So it's really just the bare minimum of fiber that I'm piercing this through. And you won't see this on the other side if you're doing this with garter stitch because the legs really get buried in garter stitch between the ridges formed by the pearl bumps and the running thread. Like I'm gonna turn this over you do not see where I pierce those legs. You don't see the weave. And I'm gonna stretch this a little bit just so that the tail, whatever amount of movement it can get done, will happen. And that looks good. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little U-turn. I'm gonna turn this upside down so I can more easily see this because I'm gonna do a little U-turn and I'm gonna start piercing the legs of the row below. In this case, this is my cast on row, but I'm gonna pierce these stitches on the row below. And I'm gonna just go through three legs here. Here's what's really important about when you do this, however. When I do my U-turn, I'm gonna pull this, but I'm going to leave a little bit of a loop of yarn, not a huge, but I don't wanna pull this tight. I wanna leave this so that the tail has a little bit of a loop there, okay? What that's going to do is it's going to give this a little bit of slack so that when it stretches, the because fabric will stretch. It will. There's no way around it. But when the fabric stretches, that little bit of loop gives it a little bit of slack so the fabric doesn't end up getting distorted. Because this is the problem people will run into when utilizing this kind of work, this kind of weave, and why people will utilize this type of weave after they've blocked is because it's easy to distort the work because the yarn is in no way following the shape of the knit stitches. Go ahead, I'm gonna just weave through my legs. Pull this. All right. There, that's woven in now. Here's the last tip. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna snip the tail, but when I snip the tail, I'm going to leave eighth to a quarter inch tail. There we go. And then I'm going to use my tapestry needle, it's easier to do with a sharp tapestry needle, and fray this, uh, this here. 
and fan that out and fray it. Um, I probably should have gone all the way to that last stitch. I can pull it out though. Let's just take that and pull it out. And then just trim that down a little bit more. That way the, the frayed edge isn't like right there at the edge of the work. What this is gonna do is when you wash and block or you wash your piece, fraying this end, it'll create a little fuzzy bit that will help keep this tail from slipping backwards. So it'll just help secure this weave. Now I'm gonna stretch this. And when I do, that weave is gonna get pulled back just a little bit more. It's gonna get this little loop that I left behind is gonna, it's gonna pull a little bit, but it'll be okay because I left enough of a loop. And notice my fabric is not distorted. So that is how you can do the horizontal weave in garter stitch. My go-to would be the modified duplicate stitch as I did over here. That's what I would choose to do, hands down, 90% of the time. When I might go ahead and utilize um, a horizontal weave as I did on this swatch with garter stitch is if I'm using a type of yarn that maybe, or where I can't see the stitch path very well, or mm, if I'm planning to felt the project, that might be a time to go ahead and just do a horizontal weave because it's quick, it's easy, it's not going to add any real extra bulk, and uh, felting will definitely secure everything down. The other thing I will say about the horizontal weave is uh, it's really good for textured stitch patterns that are like garter stitch. I wouldn't necessarily use these for knit pearl combinations, but for very spongy stitch patterns where the legs really kind of disappear into the ridges, the horizontal weave is a very quick, efficient way of weaving in your tails, and they're hidden and they're secure. But is this my go-to? No, but I'm really glad that I know how to do it, and I know how to do it well. A lot of times ribbing gets put in a separate category from overall knit pearl combinations. And I get why. Ribbing has special characteristics to it in terms of stretch and functionality than maybe a decorative knit pearl combination. I like that cowl that I did, but the weaving in techniques are really kind of the same. So here I have two by two ribbing. You can absolutely do duplicate stitch with ribbing and knit pearl combinations, and it'll work very, very well. Um, but it is a little bit of a challenge because your thread path is changing between pearls and knits columns. And you have to train your eye, basically, to look very carefully and follow the stitch path as it switches from knits to pearls. But I think it's worth getting comfortable with because if, let's say, I'm knitting a cuff, whether it's on a sleeve or a sock, that I want to be able to roll down. I don't want my weave showing when I roll down my cuff. However, it's kind of a pain in the tuchus. <laughs> it's a pain in the tuchus. And so uh, if I'm not concerned about that, if I'm not concerned about the uh, you know private side of the fabric showing to the public, I might use a vertical weave. Hey, Ed and Carrie here. So quick note, I did in fact shoot me doing some duplicate weave on ribbing and seed stitch, which will come later. But frankly, this video is getting a little long and I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of interest in that. If you want to see a video of me talking about doing duplicate stitch for ribbing or for seed stitch or anything, I'm happy to do it. But honestly, you can see what that process looks like if you watch my uh, Craft With Me part one where I finished the cow, which I will link up here. If you watch that video, you will see what that process looks like. Um, it's the same for any knit pearl combination. So, but if you want that video on doing duplicate stitch and ribbing, comment down below. But let's just continue on with doing the vertical weave. A lot of times what I will do when I'm dealing with ribbing is I might do a little bit of duplicate stitch to get up further into the fabric and over farther in and then finish off by using a vertical weave. 
In this case, I'm actually going to do my vertical weave so that I'm going up the legs of this column of stitches. The reason I do that is right now, yes, I'm looking at a column of stitches, but on the opposite side that I'm going to consider my public side, this is a column of curls and that recedes back. And so even when I stretch this, you won't see the weave. You'll see. Trust me. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my tapestry needle and I'm again I'm going to pierce the fiber of the leg. And I'm just gonna run it up this column of stitches. You only need to do like an inch, inch and a half, two inches. There we go. So that's running up. Now what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to use a little bit of duplicate stitch. I'm going to take my tapestry needle and I'm going to move this through there. Following that pearl bump. Instead of doing that U-turn like I did with the horizontal so that I can then come down the legs on the opposite side of the stitch. And I'm not going to come all the way down to where it needs. I'm only going to come part way. That's fine. And again, I'm going to stretch this. Make sure I'm happy with the weave. I'm going to check this side. Notice I'm going to pull this apart right here. This is where the weave is. And if I look closely, these legs behind the fabric look a little darker, a little thicker. But I don't see any strands of yarn. So it's very discreet, and I'm not seeing any distortion in my fabric, so that all looks good. I definitely like using the vertical weave with ribbing like this. Other knit pearl combinations like the cowl, I might opt to go ahead and use the uh, duplicate stitch because there are large enough expanses of stockinette stitch for me to look at and not having to switch between weaving the knit side of a stitch versus a purl side of the stitch. It's, it's not as complicated to follow that stitch path, but it's definitely beneficial to understand how to do this sort of vertical weave. Next, I'm going to show you what it looks like to do a weave on seat stitch. So to be honest, seat stitch is one of the things I like weaving in tails for the least. I just, because um, seat stitch in some ways is like the world's smallest broken rib. So in ribbing, all your knit stitches are stacked on top of each other and all your purl stitches are stacked on top of each other. In seat stitch, the column is alternating between knit, a knit and a purl. So when doing duplicate stitch for seat stitch, Every single stitch, you are switching between a knit stitch and a purl stitch. Back here, you can see some of where I did weave in a tail here at the neckline. In this area, I did a duplicate stitch along the seed stitch. And I did that because this felt like it was near the neckline, um, and it just seemed like that would be more discreet here. Again, it's good to understand how to do this with something like seed stitch, because if you are working on a project, like say you're making a blanket, and you're using a seed stitch border, and you need to weave in an end on that border, on a blanket, something that you might want to be reversible, it's good to understand how to do a duplicate stitch to weave in your end, because it's the most discreet thing that you can do. However, it's kind of tedious. So usually what I do with seed stitch is I go ahead and I use a vertical weave like this. And I did this here because this was just, it's underneath the arm, I didn't feel like it would be seen. Um, if this were a wool fiber, this is cotton yarn. If this were wool yarn, this would be even less apparent. I mean, this is a very apparent weave that I did here, but it's on the wrong side of the fabric. No one's going to really look all that much. However, unlike with ribbing, where I did the vertical weave through the legs of the stitch, and this time I'm going to do a vertical weave so that I pierce the pearl bump. So I'm actually going to switch my tapestry needle to the sharper one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this tail and I'm going to run it through the pearl bumps. And I'm going to pierce those pearl bumps. And this will keep this yarn secured to the back of the work. Now this is a cotton yarn 
And since it's cotton, and cotton is more slippery than wool, and the fiber itself isn't going to help secure the yarn in the same way that a wool will, I tend to weave my cotton tails longer than I do my wool ones. And then I'm going to do my U-turn, and I'm going to come back up. One of the things that the U-turn does is having the yarn tail move in different directions will help keep it in place. Like, it won't slip out as easily. I'm going to, again, leave a loop of yarn here, but I'm going to leave a slightly bigger one even than I would with wool, again, because cotton is slippery. And then I'm going to trim my tail. Now, with cotton, cotton isn't going to fuzz up the way that um, wool will, but I am still going to snip my end and I'm going to leave a good quarter inch tag. And I am going to fray the end because fraying the end will still make it harder for this end to move out of where it's this little bit of ply that it's coming out of. But with cotton, I always leave a little bit of a tail next to the work to help keep that tail staying on the private side of the fabric. There you have it. There are some more weave-in techniques if you're dealing with garter stitch, ribbing, or some other kind of knit pearl combination. And I'd love to hear from you. What are your tips and tricks for weaving in your ends? Do you have a preferred technique? Do you enjoy weaving in your ends? I hear, I hear that there are knitters out there who enjoy weaving in ends. I love to hear any tips or tricks that you have because I don't know everything. I can't possibly. As much as I like to think I do, I don't. And I'm sure a lot of you out there have some great tips to share with everyone. I hope that you enjoyed today's video and got some useful information out of it. Please be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your knitting friends. It is a really helpful way to support my channel. Another great way to support my channel is to hit subscribe and the notification bell. Hitting the notification bell lets you know whenever I upload a new video or start a live stream most Sundays at two, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern is Knit Tea Live. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have a wonderful day, evening, weekend, weeknight, whenever you may be watching this. And as always, happy health and happy knitting. Bye. I did two videos today. I am a champion of knitting on YouTube. If you're not ready to leave me, that's fine. You don't have to. We can keep this party going. At the end of the video, you're going to see a couple of video suggestions pop up for you. You can click on one of them and watch another video from me. Or if you're like, nope, Gary, don't have time today. Maybe later, don't worry, my YouTube channel is still here, and you've got one last chance to subscribe, because down in the corner there's a picture of me, you just click on that picture, and you can subscribe to my channel. So you got one more shot, one more chance to subscribe to Carrie Craft Geek, keep watching It's Where It's At, and yes, join the community. <laughs> okay, I'm done begging, I'm done begging, I'm done begging. Ain't too proud to beg, no.